All right, we're stoked because we're in the Just Talking. And our guest is Robbie Swab. He's the senior editor at Reason.com and author of Panic Attack, Young Radicals in the Age of Trump. How's it going, Robbie? Great. Good to talk to you. That's what I like to hear, man, because, man, let's just get right into it. I have so much I want to just get off my chest. And I know you're the right guy to answer all these questions because, as you stated in your book, you know, Panic Attack, Young Radicals in the Age of Trump. I kind of want to challenge you a little bit going into the fall 2020, because I know a lot you're very vocal about the rhetorical outrage that we see in the classrooms, about how sometimes there's always that one individual, not necessarily the faculty, it tends to be the student that tends to have the full control of being the vocal spotlight, I guess, in this classroom setting. So since everything is not happening live in the classroom, uh, for this fall 2020, what do you see happening with virtual classes this fall? Well, that's a, <laughs> it's quite a question. Um, I think this will be, uh, this could be a good thing actually for college students. Um, I, I really have begun to seriously question um, the value of a college education, given how much it costs. Obviously it has value, don't get me wrong, but does it have years of crippling debt value, uh, yeah. make it worth it value. I'm not sure about that. I think, uh, and in these colleges that want to charge the same amount of money, but there's no, there's no dormitory, there's no kind of party experience, which let's be real, that's what uh, most of these kids are paying for is the experience. <laughs> and you're going to charge the same amount of money, even though they're not getting any of that. I don't know, man. I think, they, <laughs> I think the kids would be well justified to take a gap year and 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 think about this yes because i like you said i mean i have a hundred thousand dollars in student loan debt i have an msa oh ma i had you know adjunct teaching jobs the whole nine and now i have no jobs so i there's, <laughs> ain't nobody hiring me next year and it make has made me really wonder like now i'm in debt for the rest of my life was it worth it yeah i mean i think a lot of people would say i wish i you know a hundred thousand dollars in debt i wish i had a hundred thousand dollars <laughs> and no college degree, or you can or get a cheap college degree from a community college, you're getting basically the same educational quality. Really what you're paying for is the, is the better social experience and of course the, the prestige or whatnot. But I think that's gonna, I think uh, the, the value that just people place on, oh, the, the most elite school and degree, I think that's gonna catch up with reality um, and maybe sooner now that uh, because of the pandemic. Well, especially since Harvard wants to charge, you know, $50,000 for tuition this fall. How, how, how can they justify that? Especially since, you know, you don't get the same experience uh, when you're in a physical setting like a classroom environment. I mean, what do you say to these universities that still think that uh, they're not downplaying the situation? Yeah, I, I, it can't be justified. Um, I think students would be wise to refuse to pay that price. I mean, Distance learning, the Zoom learning, it it is not the same at all. I, I think it's okay for the college set, uh, maybe for some high schools, K through eighth grade, no way. It does not work. It is a farce. Um, it's and you need and we we need da the daycare effect of school for kids that of that age because their parents need to go to work. So if you're not going to reopen those schools, I mean, you're going to have to provide the the state is going to have to provide daycare anyway. So it's, I, I'm, I'm a little like, are we, we're, they're really not going to reopen the schools is what it sounds like. And it's, it's, it seems a little excessive and crazy to me, given how desperately that is needed and how comparatively lower the risks seem. What would be your suggestion uh, for, because I know there's a lot of, you know, faculty and administration and teachers out there really concerned about wanting to return back in the fall, especially here in California. Uh, do you have an alternative plan or you're just not sure or like, or do we just need to get these students back into the classrooms as soon as possible? Well, we need to do one of two things. Uh, we need to either reopen schools with whatever safety precautions we can work out, need some staggered schedules, maybe not, maybe not back to school every day, something like that. Um, or, or if you're, not, if we're not going to do that, you need to like refund the tax money or something that is yes. taken from people so they yes. can arrange daycare or tutoring or whatever they need. It, it's, it's a double hit to still take the money for schools and then not have schools open. I mean, that's like, that's kind of terrible to me. And as a parent also, I was going to get my child into preschool coming up for the social effects. Obviously yeah. that's not happening. <laughs> and one thing is it's true. Zoom does not work for 
K, you know, K no through way. all the way up almost to junior high. It really doesn't work. And there are so many people in their 30s, in their 20s who want to work, who have their teacher certificate. Let them be in the classroom with them. And the people who are afraid of their health can stay home. I know your mom is really worried, Chris. You yeah. know, and forcing her to go to work when they're older and have the health thing is a problem. But there are young people like me <laughs> yeah. who would have no problem working. I'm like, get me in there. I need money. please. Yeah, but it's also it's a very slippery slope. And I don't really know the answers to it. That's why I'm not going to pretend like I'm the health expert here. But I know one of the biggest things I want to ask you, Robbie, is, is since I was asking at the top, it's like, yeah, the rhetorical outrage. It's not going to be the same, especially with Zoom, right? It's like, how am I going to like shout over Robbie when maybe a professor yeah. could just mute him out? <laughs> you know, if I don't want to hear him, it's like, nope, sorry, I'm muting out every student. I'm speaking right now. But I don't know if you heard about this, but on Wednesday, students at the California State University for the first time will be required to take a course in ethnic studies or a class with a social justice component under a policy approved by the boards of trustees. Uh, do you see this being a good idea going into the classrooms? They're saying they want to implement this by 2023 and 2024. There are uh, similar requirements to that in, um, in many other colleges, so it's not, uh, it's not so revolutionary. Um, I think it can be, that can be mundane. I mean, I wonder specifically what that means, what kind of class fulfilled. And it often ends up being arbitrary, what kind of classes satisfy like a, like a race and ethnicity requirement when you look at it. And it's like, oh, this is really just kind of like a political, straightforward, kind of, kind of a little too much indoctrinate for my taste yeah. Some in, in a lot of the cases. Um, but that's just kind of true of a lot of your your generic kind of liberal arts um, sociology type courses. Um, I think as long as kids are kind of getting a balance, it's okay. But I, I think often they are not. Well, that's why I always laugh. It's like, will we ever get a middle ground in the new decade? Because I know my old no. alumni now, I get to say, Cal State Los Angeles, they have a new video campaign they want to do. It's like, go get out and vote. Everybody that's been at Cal State Los Angeles knows it's so liberal. So I always make the joke saying, imagine if there was a guy from Youth of uh, American Freedom, you know, club, and they wanted to make a Make America Great Again campaign to go out and vote. I guarantee you that video would have been shut down by Cal State Los Angeles. And that's why I don't really don't have any faith going into the new decade that, that there will ever be some middle ground. I mean, do you see yourself uh, seeing maybe a third party growing? Uh, during the next decade? I mean, yeah, I, I'm an unabashed third party um, supporter. Um, the problem for third parties in the American system is just the system is very stacked against third parties. The, uh, the uh, structure of the Electoral College, the winner take all system that we have means there really has to be only two parties. The, the incentive is to just have two parties. And for if there's a third party movement or concern the two parties, the, 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 they, they like co-opt the issue or whatever the movement is, like, because it's winner take all. You don't get, you know, you, you don't, you don't have coalitions of parties the way you have in like parliamentary governments in England, where you have a bunch of parties and then these two work together to form a majority. And then there's these other three. Our system is just not like that at, in a very fundamentally flawed way. So it's so hard for third parties to emerge. Well, Robbie, in the last week, we've gotten a couple of resolutions for this, because I know that yesterday, Representative Louis Gomer asked House to remove the Democratic Party for, quote, historically supporting slavery. So maybe that might end the two party system. And uh, we also got, you know. Uh, I'm like, all no. The, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or what we could do, Robbie, is we could write in our vote for Kanye West. What do you suggest? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Who are you going to write? If you had to write in somebody, if you had to write them in, who mm. would you write in? Uh, well, I, you know, so I'm a big fan of Representative Justin Amash, uh, who's a, a independent, libertarian-leaning former Republican, and I thought he was going to be the Libertarian Party candidate, but he decided not to run, and I was like, I'm going to write his name in anyway, and then he even said, even if I somehow won because people wrote my name in, I would not serve as president. I'm like, okay, fine, I really don't know what I can do. <laughs> <laughs> well, you do okay, know. You have, you have a much, um, like... <laughs> A better political one. I was going to write in Cardi B because okay. that is the American dream. <laughs> you can be a, if you can be a second rate stripper yeah. and turn oh. into a first rate rapper with all that money, that's the American dream. Jeff okay. Bezos, move over. <laughs> <laughs> you need to stop playing. But on the real, I know with the upcoming vote in 102 days from now, who will you be voting for? 
Because uh, I know. I, we'll... I'll probably vote for the Libertarian Party candidate, Joe Jorgensen, uh, who's not a, a well known person. But, and so, you know, I was thinking, am I really going to vote for someone like I've never heard of her? And then I listened to her talk for about 10 seconds. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I agree with everything she's saying. So I'll, <laughs> I'll probably vote for her. Yeah. And I think in your book, um, I believe it was in your book that you had mentioned that a lot of independents, I feel like in an interview or a book, so correct me if I'm wrong, but a lot of independents, if they actually looked at what their political affiliations might be, would actually fall within libertarian, which is less government, but social programs to help out. You want um, libertarians want to abolish ICE. They want to um, redo the penal system, get rid of the drug, you know, obviously people yeah. getting thrown in jail because of marijuana when it's legal, you know, all that stuff. So can you speak on that a little bit? Yeah, um, you know, it, it's about it, it, consistency. Um, you know, a lot of Republicans uh, are like, yeah, we want less government you know, taxes and regulation, et cetera, but then they want much more government in, you know, your personal life, social issues, et cetera. And many Democrats are the opposite, you know, it, right, progressive social values, you know, letting people live their lives the way they want, but then lots of very punitive taxes and regulation. I, I'm just consistent across the board. I want government not involved in your life. I think that's an appealing message for a lot of people anyway. Yes, we're not gonna police what you do in the bedroom with drugs, et cetera. But we're also not gonna make it uh, miserable for you to open up a small business and comply with all these insane regulations. That's the libertarian platform. I think it appeals to a lot of people, um, but it, it's, you know, it's just, it's again, it's such a two party system and it's such a, it's such a vicious time just in terms of like political commentary and the, 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 the drive to pick a side or pick a tribe mm -hmm is just really is really intoxicating i think Since well, I, I, oh, sorry, well I was gonna say on that note i wanted to share something with you so marissa could you share the tweet with yes. uh, maria rutenberg because i thought this was quite interesting so this is all happening in california so there's a california resident who asked redwood city to allow me to paint make america great again 2020 next to black lives matter on the broadway instead they are erasing black lives matter I stand for the First Amendment and everyone's right to express their political views in a new public form of street asphalt. So <laughs> that kind of made me laugh. But they're now, I guess Redwood City Council's now claiming that, you know, she's claiming they they erased Black Lives Matter because they didn't want to put Make America Great Again next to each other. Now Redwood City Council's saying they had to get rid of it because now it's creating a traffic hazard. I don't know what kind of traffic hazard, what, from space? <laughs> but yeah. I mean, I. Don't you see? It's like, I don't see how we're ever going to get to a middle ground if we're going to continue with this sort of rhetoric about how it's very private, politically driven uh, a level. Because uh, like we already know, Republicans aren't very much speaking up for the issues of Black Lives Matter. And why is this becoming very heavily politicized going into November? So politicized. And I, I saw somewhere, uh, yeah, there was a Black Lives Matter was painted on the street and then someone started uh, uh they were painting over it to get rid of it just you know what's really so, funny about that, that did that and then <laughs> but then they got charged and I'm like they shouldn't do that but then i'm like oh they're being charged with a hate crime i'm like okay that's you know we don't need to lock them in prison for a trillion years either well you know what's really funny about that robbie that was actually our guest two weeks ago that really? was Evelyn bt yeah she's uh she, and the funny part about that was yeah she threw black paint all over black lives matter in front of trump tower but the thing is she got released out of jail within like three hours and went that's back cool. at midnight and dumped it all over again and what do you say to those people like that because it's like i thought a lot of us are trying to get to that reconciliation that rioting and looting and just damaging city property that doesn't even get our point across on yeah. a level i mean what do you say to people i guess like a bevel and who is doing these actions i mean everything like it's a shame that again everything is so tribalized like yes i i think of course, Black Lives Matter. I want to, you know, reform uh, 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 the criminal justice system, how police treat uh, other citizens. Um, and I think, again, I think a lot of people support that. But then it get, you know, some of the activists on those issues take it so far, like it's about overthrowing global capitalism and, you know, explicit Marxism. And, and, uh, and, it, and it, they talk about it in, I think, kind of the most racialized version of it that, you know, police is, is Bad oh, policing is only a racial issue, uh, which isn't true. I, I mean, it's like <laughs> police <laughs> have they they bother in a, in a very negative way. People, like, white people as well. You like being white is no guarantee that you're not going to be hassled by the police. Yeah. Um, of course, there are racial problems in the criminal justice system, but focus. I, I think it was a, it's been a mistake from progressive but activists sometimes to portray it as only a race issue. 
Right. But it's also just drives me nuts when I see this week, uh, you know, presidential candidates running our former VP, Joe Biden, that's literally saying Donald Trump is our first racist president. <laughs> I mean, sometimes I question, does he really understand why people are toppling down monuments and statues? It's because they're butthurt that former slave owners, aka ex-presidents, you know, which were 12 former you know, slave Woodrow owners. Wilson resegregated the federal service in like 1915 or something. So right. <laughs> but it's, just, not, it's, it's just not true. <laughs> right. I mean, but we also got this rhetoric that, you know, that with because I know that you spoke in front of Congress last year. I mean, you spoke about the issue about how this this ideology in Americans viewpoints that, you know, the KKK is running rapidly across the nation. White supremacy is even larger than ever. I mean, there's individuals right now that would say you're absolutely wrong, Robbie. And what do you say to them right now, knowing the statistics of it in 2020 today? Well, that's I, I just I try to point out um, facts and rely on good information, and you know, and not dismiss my critics. Like, yes, white supremacy is a problem. The internet has made it easier for alt right type people no. to organize and make their voices known. At the same time. Um, like violence, murder is not up. Ideologically motivated violence. I mean, yeah, obviously you can you hear stories and things, but statistically it has not increased um, in recent years. Uh, white nationalists like don't go out and kill a lot of people. Nor do nor do like Antifa. Nor do yeah. Islamists. Like extremists in general. Um, it, it, there are a lot of there are a lot of ways you can get killed in America, but but because someone hates you ideologically is not a particularly likely one. And I think that's important to keep in mind as we talk about like free speech and the cost of that. Actually, people don't go out and kill each other for ideological reasons all that often. Yeah, well, you had a great chapter in your book about that with the extremists. Um, and I highly recommend people to actually read your book. I picked it up. I read it. It's an easy read. Thank God. <laughs> After <laughs> getting my MA, I hate anything scholarly. I'm like, shoot me in the head. It's the worst. But, uh, no. Yeah, no, but it, it made it to the sense where I think you were able to look at both points of uh, both people's ideologies and say, look, there's a small percentage of mm -hmm. that, that the media is magnifying and having that conceptualizing of what is the media, that's their job, magnify something, but we have to contextualize that. And you, yeah. you talk about that in your book, which is so great. But let me ask you this, Robbie, because I I do feel, uh, are, are we getting all the facts? Because I know as this pandemic has turned into, as many TV pundits are saying, it's becoming a political football field. And I know here in California, millennials, the largest demographic in our country, are gambling their community's health to have a few beers at Huntington Beach. And I know with COVID-19 right now, the age group between 18 and 34 in California, for example, they're saying is uh, coming out with testing positive way more than 35 to 49 year olds in Arizona. Over 60% of the new infections are coming from people under the age of 45. Um, I just know that California just had the highest mortality rate death yesterday with 176. So will we ever get some middle ground with the COVID-19 situation? Because I always felt like personally, once we got rid of the WHO, we never had the CDC and the WHO kind of challenging each other as two powerful scientific organizations. I kind of thought that's what science was all about. Um, where do you see yourself right now with COVID-19? Um, I think it's very hard to, even if it's wise, even if it's in everyone's best interest to require everyone to stay home, I think it's it's just increasingly hard to reasonably expect people to do that. Man, humans are social animals. We want to see each other. We want to go back to work. We want to socialize. And this just kind of no, everybody, you know, stay inside for virtually, you know, until this problem is magically solved, which could be six months from now. It could be a year from now. It could be never. It it could be never. Yeah. Um, I think it's just increasingly unrealistic. I, I think. The, government, the proper role for the government at this point is to just give people good information, inform people about what kinds of activities are risky, according to what science uh, is saying, and not be overly punitive or harsh in that we're going to require you to do this. And, you know, you can you can have a hamburger on the sidewalk, but not chicken <laughs> wings or so, which is what uh, the governor of New York is well, doing right now, which is just crazy yeah. to me. Or like, you know, 10 people to funeral, but not 11. But protests are exempted. And it's just it seems chaotic and crazy and uh, and, and actually biased and actively uh, 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 will cause people to disobey it for that reason. So I'm at the point where I, I want good guidance on what 
should should happen, but people need to basically make up their own minds. And, and we well, have to prepare that some people are going to make decisions that put themselves and others at risk. Well, let really me ask wrong. you this, Rob, because I always felt like the elevation of virus denial is strongly happening right now is because we're in the middle of all these protests, right? But then you got the Huffington Post, you got BuzzFeed, you got all these organizations that are going, oh, you know, we don't have any statistical evidence that shows that any spike of COVID cases are coming from protests. If that was really the case, then why did we ban the beaches for 4th of July? Right. If outside gatherings don't create the COVID spike. And that's why I think with our, it's not so much on the national level, it's our local politics that I think is really hurting us on a level about how we're ever going to get back to reality because it never seems like any of us are in agreement with anything. <laughs> well, and again, because of the tribalization, you only trust information from your side. So there's a lot of people, you know, in, who just, just, distrust everything they hear from the Trump White House. There's a lot of people who distrust everything they hear from conservative media. Uh, then there, there's people who distrust everything they hear from mainstream media and right. from scientific experts. Um, they, we don't have a shared conversation or a shared, like here are the people we all kind of collectively trust in. And some, and there are benefits to that too, because those people have got, you know, got things wrong historically, the, the so-called neutral arbiters of information in journalism in like previous decades. Now there's no gatekeeping. You can go, it's all sorts yeah. of information everywhere and you kind of just have to decide what you believe. Uh, but the downside of that is there's a lot of disinformation out there and a lot of people who believe it. That's why I want to add it to the final point we got here towards the end of this interview, because I know you're writing a brand new book that's going to be addressing the culture of social media. And I know a new study from the Pew Research Center shows that social media use among congressional representatives has nearly doubled since 2016 on Twitter. And last week, Twitter's high profile accounts such as Elon Musk and Bill Gates, to name a few, were a part of this cryptocurrency hack. Are you concerned about the legitimacy of a November election? Um, I, I don't think I'm concerned about the legitimacy. I think that's often uh, that concern is overstated. There was a lot of uh, the idea that like advertisements on Facebook somehow, you know, change thousands or millions of votes is a little uh, is a little like listen to listen to the radio, watch the television. If you do that all day, you will hear so much factual misinformation and nobody's freaked out about that because that's been the case for decades. So it's something it's to me it's that social media is new and so the new thing is always the thing people freak out about oh what kind of effect this is having. You know it has some positive effects it has some negative effects just like any other medium. So I, I think there's there was too much uh, in the last election cycle too much uh, blaming of Facebook in particular. Maybe it'll be Twitter this time. Maybe but we all, but else. we do have Twitter right now that I know certain uh, members in the House want to have Jack Dorsey speak on the floor because obviously with this situation, just last month, it wasn't too long ago, they decided to fact check the president for the first time, anybody on Twitter. They just happened to do Donald Trump first. And to me, sometimes I thought that was kind of alarming because the reason why I mentioned the legitimacy one, they just tried to fact check us about a month ago. And then two, you know, people are really concerned about mail-in ballots going in. Yeah. So th I've always been a physical guy. I haven't had too many problems with mail-in ballots, but I do get concerned about the idea that if we did start turning things into digital voting, should we be concerned on a level? Because I feel like Twitter's showing that example just within these last months that they still have a lot of work they gotta do. They do, and we'll see. <laughs> but it will still continue to be an important part of the conversation, um, that's for sure. And I think people will maybe come to value their privacy more soon, and that could be the next phase. As people saying tweeting everything that comes to mind is not actually a good idea. <laughs> God, I hope so. <laughs> I feel you. Like, so stop, so. stop using Twitter as a therapeutic session, <laughs> millennials, please. But I want to thank Robbie Swab again for being our Just Talking guest. Go and pick up his book, Panic Attack, Young Radicals in the Age of Trump. Yes. Thank you, Robbie. Thank you Thank so you. much.